dissertation process in the stem. Oh, she got it. All right, there you go. All right. <laughs> and then it looks like we are now recording too. Uh, so I'll, I'll step back here. Thank you, Jose. <laughs> All right, so uh, again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Doctoral Student Summit, Navigating the Dissertation Process and Establishing a Research Agenda Panel Discussion. My name is Cleese Mellihan. I am a University of San Francisco doctoral student in the Organization and Leadership Program, and I will have the honor of serving as moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, with us here, we have four fantastic panelists. Uh, one of them is actually my, my co-chair as well, uh, Philippe, and I uh, had a wonderful time kind of getting this group together and, and getting excited for the, today's event. And, uh, and before we get into this, kind of a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so just kind of first to start off by saying that we will have uh, one hour uh, where we will be hearing our panelists uh, discuss and share their views on social equity, as well as their dissertation research um, or when they were in school and talk about their experiences doing that. And then we will follow that with 30 minutes where the audience can ask questions. And feel free anytime throughout the uh, event, you can type in questions into the chat box and we will do everything we can to try to make sure we get through all those questions. And uh, just kind of a side note, uh, some of us have had some trouble with the closed captioning, uh, but the live transcription is working is my understanding. Uh, so if you need to have that, that is available. There's an icon on the bottom that says CC. Click on that and then click on live transcription. And, um, and then before we get into this as well, I just want to do a quick reading of Rhonda V. Maggie's recognition of the land that University of San Francisco is located on. Um, the University of San Francisco resides on the traditional homelands of the Ramatush Ohlone tribal nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. We celebrate the public presence of Haloni descendants who are working today to preserve and nourish their indigenous identity. We invite you to take a moment to feel the land beneath your feet. So much has happened on this land that has been centered in violence and injustice and in love and joy. We can hold this hypocrisy through awareness, dedication, to land and racial justice, and a commitment to joy as justice. Uh, again, these words were inspired by Rhonda V. Maggie from the USF School of Law. And um, so yeah, so thank you. And uh, thank you again to the panelists. We're gonna jump into this now. Uh, so uh, let's kind of give maybe a minute per panelist, if you can do an, introduce yourself by stating your name, a brief summary of your background and the research that interests you. Um, and then we'll kind of start with uh, Wendy, then we'll go on to Anthony, then Joanna, and then Philip. So uh, take it away, Wendy. Awesome. Thank you. Good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I am Wendy Nicholson. I am a rising fourth year doctoral student at the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers Newark. Um, I have a BS in psychology from Tufts University, an MPA from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and I've always been uh, interested in uh, DEI work, social justice, social equity, even before I had the language for what it was called. Um, and so now my uh, specializations in the program are governmental budgeting and finance and social equity. I've had the opportunity to actually do some work where I put both of those together and uh, my dissertation will be on racial battle fatigue among black female faculty, higher ed administrators and uh, faculty and administrators. Hi everyone, my name is Joanna Estrella. Uh, my pronouns are she, ella. I'm a third year doctoral stu student in international and multicultural education at the University of San Francisco. Um, I am Yusavi and Southern Mexican first gen from Wichin Ohlone territory, currently known as East Oakland, California. My interests are bilingual education, indigenous language preservation among Latinx indigenous communities in the Bay Area, participatory action research, uh, indigenous Latinx indigeneities, racial linguistics and education for liberation. Um, I have over 10 years experience in teaching and lecturing English as a foreign language in Europe and Asia. And I'm currently joining you this morning from South Korea. Uh, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Stark. I am an assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Denver. And in the fall, I'll be the incoming uh, assistant professor of social equity and public administration at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I hold bachelor's degrees in clinical psychology and human services from Old Dominion University. Uh, Master's of Public Administration and Post Baccalaureate Certificate in Nonprofit Management from Virginia Commonwealth University, and a PhD in Public Administration from the University of Nebraska Omaha, where I specialize in the areas of public policy, public administration theory, and Black studies. My research interests, uh, I'm sorry, my research interests include. Um, issues related to the social construction of identity, citizenship, democracy, community engagement in higher education, um, and public administration theory. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Felipe Blanco. I'm a PhD candidate and instructor at the School of Public Administration at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, in terms of research, uh, of course, I'm interested in social equity. In particular, ethno-racial inequalities, how can they be produced or reproduced in public organizations in both the US, but also in Latin America and particularly uh, in, in, in Mexico, where I was uh, born and raised. Um, in terms of my academic background, I have a BA in economics, a master's in public administration slash public policy. And I'm uh, currently conducting my dissertation, which uh, takes a look to the ethno-racial composition of public administration at the federal level in Mexico, and trying to understand how that composition or what, what are the, some of the implications of that particular composition uh, for social equity uh, in the country. So thank you. I should be the one thanking each of you for being here. It's a wonderful group here. Uh, so we'll start off with the first question. Um, I'll, I'll direct this to Anthony here. How has it been to navigate through the dissertation process? Navigating the dissertation process was, for me, an exciting time. Um, as a doctoral student at the University of Nebraska Omaha, in my final year there, I was awarded uh, the University of Nebraska Presidential Fellowship, which pretty much allowed me uh, the time and resources that I needed to focus on my dissertation. My dissertation research um, examined the administrative discourse of non-elected, non-appointed federal personnel leading up to and after the 1996 US welfare reform. Um, and so navigating that process, uh, I'll talk a bit about this, I believe in, in future questions, was challenging, but it was really an eye-opening process for me to really begin to um, gain a better understanding of the ways in which I approach questions, um, the different inquiries that I had as it related to issues of social equity and being able to define that in terms of my own research, but also working with a slew of faculty, my committee, uh, there's a committee member here, Dr. Jody Benenson, uh, who was extremely instrumental in that process as well. And so I really enjoyed um, being able to delve into that particular space. And I'm happy to talk more about it in detail with any specific questions um, that you all may have. I'm wondering about the dissertation journey, it's just that growth, right? You're learning something new. And you mentioned that you kind of sort of had your, uh, your vision broadened, eye opening. Was there any specific um, class that you remember or a topic that really stood out that like changed your perspective on things? There were a number of things uh, throughout the, the PhD journey. The very first one actually occurred the summer before I began the PhD. And so in August of 2014, I moved from Virginia to uh, Omaha, Nebraska and drove through Missouri. And we were happening, uh, we happened to drive through Missouri during uh, the time of the protests in relation to the murder of Michael Brown. And so when I left Virginia Commonwealth University as a master's student beginning uh, the PhD journey, I had this idea that I would be focusing on nonprofit management. I worked in the nonprofit sector for a number of years and wanted to learn more about um, community development corporations and the impact that they had in their communities. But with all that was going on in the world, that really kind of shifted some of the questions that I was asking. And I used to joke a great deal, and I still do, that I thought they were going to kick me out of my PhD program when I got there to tell them that I didn't want to study nonprofit management anymore. And surprisingly, I was 
encouraged to pursue those interests. And I mentioned in my introduction that one of the areas that I focus in was Black Studies. So I was able to take additional coursework in the Black Studies Department at the university um, that really helped to shift my thinking, but it also helped me to contextualize public administration. So being able to take the language of public administration, the lenses, the tools, the theories that we uh, that we use on a regular basis and take them to a different discipline, to take them into a Black study space where they're talking about issues of race and the social construction of identity and decentering whiteness and many of these other um, very uh, humanities oriented subject matter and being able to um, draw connections between public administration, public policy, public management, and what was happening, what was being discussed in that field. Um, so that was instrumental for me. Uh, moving into the dissertation process, um, I was encouraged to read widely. Um, I know that the PhD process is akin to drinking from a fire hose. You're taking in so much information all the time throughout uh, the coursework phase, and then you move into your examination phase, and then all of the scaffolding falls, uh, and you're kind of out at sea trying to find your, your dissertation topic. And so I read widely and there was actually one journal article uh, that was written by a social work scholar. Two sentences from that one journal article uh, became the launch pad for my dissertation project. And um, I'm sure I believe with some of the other questions, I'll get into that in more detail, but those were two events that were really instrumental and kind of watershed moments for me uh, in the dissertation process and in the PhD process. Very cool, very cool. And so uh, to Wendy, uh, same question, you know, you know how, how has it been to navigate through the dissertation process for you? Wendy? Uh, for me, it's, uh, I guess, somewhat different than most students. I am certainly a non-traditional student. I am um, significantly older than most of the students in my program and certainly in my cohort. Um, and I'm a part-time student and a full-time employee. So it's very different uh, for me to sort of navigate this because I have a lot of other uh, responsibilities. And I sometimes question whether, you know, there's some loss of sanity to think that I could navigate a, a PhD process while working full-time. And then 10 months ago, I was um, appointed as the executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for a community college in New York City. So extremely different than what I was doing before and now being an administrator and being uh, responsible for guiding the college in this whole effort is a whole lot different. Um, the good thing about it is that I get to see the hands-on to my research on a daily basis because I work with every constituent at the college. Um, and vice versa, I get to look at what's happening and uh, make sure I incorporate a lot of that information into the work that I'm writing. So it's, it's difficult in that respect. It's also difficult for me. I am certainly an A personality type person. I'm very organized, detailed. I knew what I wanted to do coming in. I have my timing. I like to do everything um, in advance and having to sit and wait for my chair to get back to me on information um, is stressful. It is really stressful. I know what I'm ready to do and when I want to do it. And so um, getting used to having to work with, you know, my chair and, and my committee is certainly a, a learning process for me. Um, the plan is to be done next spring. Uh, so this is going to be a really, really uh, tough year for me. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's been a complete learning process. Um, you know, one of the classes I took, Qual 1, uh, not Qual 1, Quant 1, when I came in, I was at a disadvantage uh, because I didn't have the real foundation for it. And so I was asked to do the advanced work and I literally had to teach myself the basic stuff and do the advanced stuff at the same time and I literally thought I was going to fail the course and everybody knew it I, I was just you know it was awful but what I learned for myself was that even when I thought I didn't have anything left that I could dig deep and find something and keep going 
and go from feeling like or knowing that I had an F to actually getting an A in the class. And so that gave me a lot of the impetus I needed to keep going in the program, even when I was feeling bad. And, you know, the last few months have been really a moment for me. Um, but again, um, it's been helpful to have a, a couple of mentors that I've had before I got into the program who have been really helpful to me. They, they know me, they know when to be gentle, <laughs> they know when to push. Um, and I've met some fellow PhD students, um, some who have recently become officially doctor, um, who, you know, have been there, who check on me every day or I check in with them every day. And so it's helpful to feel like I'm not alone um, because it often feels that way because their experience is so much different than, than mine. Um, but it's certainly not an impossible endeavor, uh, but you certainly have to have a lot of fortitude to do it the way I'm doing it. I wouldn't recommend it, but it certainly is doable. There's so much from that. I, my, my first thing I want to say is uh, it must be so rewarding to be able to, to see the research you're doing on a daily basis, because you mentioned a little bit earlier. And, uh, and maybe that contributes towards that sort of momentum to kind of keep going, right? Um, and uh, But actually, I wanted to uh, follow up a question, actually, about working with the dissertation committee. And you had mentioned about, um, you know, are they going to follow up on time? And, you know, you want to, you want to get to go and and get the next step completed. Are there any tricks that you develop in trying to keep the communication going with the dissertation committee and that they will follow up? <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are certainly no tricks that I have because they're going to respond when they're going to respond. Um, I, I did have a fellow PhD student. Um, I hope he's here, Dr. Kareem Willis. Congratulations, he just got his, his uh, he defended recently. Um, you know, I had a, 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 an alarm set for him every day at 11 o'clock and I would check in with him every day. What are you doing for your dissertation today? What are you writing? What's your agenda? And it would just help to give him sort of that motivation and just advice when he was feeling down. And so we've been talking, he knows how bad I've been feeling recently and actually gave me some of my own advice. And oftentimes when people do that, you feel like they're throwing it back at you, but, um, I was so um, like just burdened under everything that was going on that I really couldn't think of my own advice. But when he said it to me, you know, about, look, there's nothing you can do right now about whether your chair gets back to you on what you're waiting for, but what can you do in the meantime, right? Get other little pieces in place so that when it is time to move, you're already there. You're already ready, right? Stop stressing about it. I know it's difficult, um, but do what you can in the meantime and um, just let, let the rest of it go. So there, 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 there are no tips or tricks to it. Um, I often joke with people and tell them I'm going through my Obama phase. I started, it was all black. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna make up, wake up one morning, it's just gonna be all white. Um, because I do stress myself and that's something I have to learn to sort of back off. So, but tricks for the committee, there are none. <laughs> it's really a lesson in patience. But it does sound like you're getting that support and connecting with others and that's wonderful advice for, for any doctoral student. Um, so that's a really important lesson. So thank you for, for sharing that piece. And uh, so I'll carry that question over to Joanna now uh, who is in the midst of, I believe, trying to pick her topic, or maybe she has already. So Joanna, uh, share us how, how you're going through the process. So just to be clear, um, how I research my um, topic, how I develop my research topic, am I right? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, just to quickly respond to some of the few points that Wendy said, I mean, age is just a number, Aliyah said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and I think that um, when you're in this doctorate journey, it's it's quite lonely, but um, everyone benefits from having a diverse group in your cohort. So, you know, I know that for sure. I appreciate the people who are much younger than me, older than me, because that's where you really get more of a full um, 
grasp of things of, and what's going on. Um, so I know that you must be a blessing to whoever you share your classroom space with, especially because you come from an unorthodox background, because it's those backgrounds that often don't get seen and get ignored. And um, they talk a lot about the ivory tower and how a lot of academics are disconnected um, when they're in their process. And so having different people in your cohort is definitely um, a true blessing. Um, in my case, also another um, unorthodox student, um, I think one of the best advice I received um, while I was applying to PhD programs and EDD programs, um, and at the time I was quite unsuccessful because I was trying to go into a, a subject that I wasn't, um, I didn't have a background in. I originally wanted to do like social, like linguistics or something of that sort, but I didn't really have that linguistics background. And so um, at the same time I was working in academia for about eight years right before I got admitted to a program. And the best advice that um, someone ever gave me was to find a program, find a school, not for the name and not for um, prestige necessarily, but find, find people who will support you on a personal level and find people who will believe in you because that's what is most essential during your doctorate program. Um, because if you don't have that support or you don't have people who necessarily believe in your dreams or your vision, then you're going to just add more weight to your shoulders because the doctoral program is hard enough. You know, it's it's just the research alone and just developing topics and going through the whole process. That that's enough as it is. And so adding, you know, maybe a, a, a faculty who's giving you an extra hard time for whatever reason may be there. There's just no space for that. And so I think I was very lucky to find um, a program in where I where I found that support and. And I picked my committee members based on um, the personal relationships as well as the academic relationships, as well as the, the resources and the knowledge that they provide. But more than anything, I feel um, very supported. And um, we in class, we learned a lot about you know, bell hooks and, and Yoso. And Yoso uses this concept of funds of knowledge where you, know, you bring in all, all the knowledge that you, have, that you bring beforehand, it's all valid. You know, it's not like, only the things that you learn in school are valid and all the things, you know, leave yourself at the door, those things don't count. No, you bring your whole self in. And so because I was allowed that space and because I was encouraged to, to bring my whole self into the program with me, I was able to maybe value um, aspects about my past, about my work, about my experience that are unique to me that I thought, you know what, this could really serve me in my doctoral program because this could also be not just a, a, uh, a project where I'm, learning something that I that I'm actually genuinely interested in not necessarily trying to fill a hole somewhere um, but I'm also using it as a as a project of almost self-healing in a way um, so that's how I got to develop my research topic um, it was because um, a lot of teachers inspired me a lot of professors inspired me they pushed but when the pushing got tough they also supported me and I think this is very particular to me because uh, when I was developing my project, it was like in the, as during the essence of the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, there were people who got stricter or didn't act as if the world wasn't falling all around us. And there were there and then, and then there were professors like mine who were very very supportive of their students, actually cared about our mental health and our well being, and if we lost our job or if our family had died and. In my case, I had so many family members that passed away during the pandemic. So, you know, you ask people to write or to 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 get creative, they just can't. And and it's thanks to those professors that um, I was able to push through and and come up with something quite unique for myself. That's wonderful, you know. And, and yeah, our teachers are generally speaking there to kind of give us that push and help us out and that support. And uh, and I didn't like how you mentioned about healing, that doctoral process can be a healing process for, for many students. Um, and I think there's often experience that will bring us into the doc program that sort of encourages to go into it. Um, as to follow up, hey, I will, uh, same question, how is the doctoral process going for you and, and what has it been like for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess just to start, uh, I, I, I would like to say that I was already living here in Nebraska when I started my program. So I moved from Mexico City to, Nebraska big change in 2016. And then by 2000, 
18 is when I started my program and, and, and I really feel so fortunate and privileged because it's the only program that I applied for and it has been a great experience so far. I am going to echo some of the things that Anthony mentioned earlier because I have found really uh, a lot of support, a lot of guidance. I also uh, think, as Joanna just mentioned, that personal relationships matter as much as, you know, like having someone that, of course, you want uh, someone uh, providing feedback and you want experts, you know, like providing uh, feedback on your projects and ideas, but you also have someone that are, that are empathetic and that don't understand the special circumstances that we're living in, in, in these crazy, crazy times. And, and, and really personally, I have uh, found that, that at UNO and, and, and also really at other places that I have had the chance to uh, kind of academically work at here at UNL, at U University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I took a class here uh, and kind of similar to Anthony's experience, that class allowed me to develop an, a topic that, 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 that I ended up uh, really uh, getting into and exploring more that ended up this uh, idea of uh, ethno-racial identities in Mexico, which of course is closely connected to PA literature, to uh, the theories of, of representative bureaucracy and, 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 and social equity as well. Uh, and I guess, yeah, really that, that's for me, that has been my experience. Uh, the, the, the other thing probably that worked for me while developing my topic, because uh, I was, when I started my program, I came with this idea on working more about a, evaluation because that's what I did in Mexico for like three or four years before before moving and again obviously that changed that changed radically that changed a lot and, and the way that happened was really writing different papers for different classes so, uh, the, the, the first year especially until really I found this uh, uh, the, these ideas of social equity and, and racial equity and and, and and lately, uh, representative bureaucracy and its relationship with with, with social equity. Um, I think, lastly, the other thing that was uh, helpful for me to narrow my topic and find that topic that I that I like for my dissertation was getting ready for my field exams here at UNO. Have the field exams, and it's <laughs> like four broad, broad questions, but really, of course, uh, to, to demonstrate the knowledge in the field. And mine was about uh, public administration theory, race and ethnicity in public administration, public policy, and, and methodology, especially qualitative uh, methodology. But really working on, 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 on the field exams allowed me to, 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 to really craft my or, or narrow down my dissertation topic, especially, again, when I was reading uh, about social equity and, and, and representative bureaucracy. And then I found a gap uh, in, in, in literature as in terms of uh, these ideas are still heavily unexplored in Mexico for several reasons. But yeah, I think that's it. O o other than that, really, again, I feel so, 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 so fortunate and, and privileged and I have had a great experience at my program. It's great to hear that you're having a wonderful experience. With your process and, and all of us i'm sure we all kind of can be stressed out to going through the process and um and actually some of you kind of touched already a little bit on uh kind of how you were doing your developing the research topic um but i kind of want to give another opportunity to dive deeper into this and i'll, I'll start with joanna um so was developing a research topic challenging or did you know from the start what you wanted to study I knew that I was going into bilingual education, that I was going into linguistic rights, maybe language policy of some sort. Like it was, it was very blurry in the beginning. And um, I think similar to how Felipe said, like writing different papers for different classes um, and being exposed to, to different, um, different areas, different subjects um, and approaching it uh, not just in one way, but maybe from the top, from the bottom, from the sides, um, that really helped develop it in my case. Um, I think when it came to really honing down on and making it more like something more concentrated, something more specific, what surprisingly helped me was um, doing my methodology first. And I thought that that was, um, 
I, I wasn't sure why like our program had set it up that way. Like, I'm, you know, if you remember, Chris, you were there in my class. <laughs> um, I, at that time, I wasn't sure why um, like the program set it up so that we do our methodology chapter first, and then we go to chapter one or chapter two or whatever, then we go into all those things. But I'm really happy that it happened that way because um, methodology, you're basically exploring the reasons why. Like, why are you doing this research and how are you going to approach it? And so looking through that lens of like the why, you know, that really um, um, put it into focus for me. Like, why why am I even in this program? Why am I getting this PhD? Is it just for, for clout? Is it just for job prospects? Is it just for that? And, and I had to really sit with myself and ask myself first, okay, what is important to me? What do I want to get out of this? What is... What is um, what am I comfortable with? Um, am I solely um, contributing something to literature, or am I going to go into the field? Or what are what what do I want to work at in the future? Like how is this going to bridge um, my my doctoral program with the prospective job? How does this connect um, X, Y, and Z? And so going through that first and and finding exactly the project that I wanted. Um, after that, I was able to go into the background and the history, and then that. I mean, by then, I already somewhat knew of uh, what I what I had to um, research and find, and so that has helped me. That was sort of the same story for me. It was a bit of a blur as well in starting the program, uh, and yes, I totally agree with you. The it was kind of confusing with the certain class you had to take and how it kind of got split at a certain point. So I, I can totally relate to that. Uh, Wendy, uh, was it challenging for you, or did you know right right off the bat that you what you wanted to do? Um, I'm I pretty off. much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry folks. I, I just wanted to pop in um, to say hello to everyone. I was at another meeting, but uh, I wanted to show my support for this. I, I'm so very pleased and um, and honored that um, Cleese and also Felipe, Felipe or Felipe and Cleese uh ran with this idea um, um so you all can blame me for getting this together because it was kind of my brainchild but but they're the ones that that ran with it and put it together and to see so many people in this session is is great i see my dear friend from the great state of new jersey there uh i hope you're well and then uh my other good friend and uh fellow fraternity greek brother uh dr stark how you doing in on tenure track? Loving it. Okay. Oh, that wow. That's not quite what I said when I was on tenure track. But good for you. All right. I think that's awesome. So, anyway, I I don't want. <laughs> and of course, we know that uh, Dr. Alzari is on tenure track now at US, URS. So, anyway, folks. So, I'm I'm sorry to have interrupted. I just want to pop in, give my support, give my love, and let you all know that I'm very proud of you. If, if I can do anything to assist you along your way, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, to let me know. I'm here for you, okay? Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Awesome, thank you. And he actually means that because I've reached yes, out to him for, for assistance and he's right on target, right on time. So I appreciate you popping in and love your support. Thank you. Um, as far as my journey in developing my, uh, my topic, I, pretty much had an idea of what I was gonna do coming in. Uh, I was sort of looking more generally in terms of just black faculty and administrators. Um, and honestly, right right before I started the program, I presented at this conference back in, in 2019 where I met Dr. Kareem Willis. He was the very first student I met in the program. Um, and while I was there, a colleague called and we were talking. She knew I was at the conference and she said to me, listen, I learned this, this label and it sounds like what you're interested in. And she told me racial battle fatigue. And it just so happened that Dr. William Smith, who coined the phrase, was going to be in New York in an area that I could get to um, the next month. And so I made sure to go to that conference to um, you know, have an opportunity to learn more about this, this particular topic. And it was right where I, I needed to be. Um, I met him 
and uh, we've been in contact ever since occasionally. You know, I'll reach out to him and he's also been very helpful too in walking me through any questions that I have. And as I was beginning to read the literature, like Joanna said and Felipe said, I started to see some gaps and the gaps were in black female um, faculty and administrators. And so I redefined what I was looking at instead of just looking at uh, black faculty and administrators and looking specifically at at women and there truly is a dearth of information there um, and gives me an opportunity to sort of get my foot in the door and uh, guide some things and one of the things that Dr. Smith told me was listen we need all the research we can get on racial battle fatigue right because it started out as uh, initiative looking at the experiences of black males in higher ed so to be able to expand that to look at uh, faculty and administrators who are black and female that really helped a lot because it helped me to open up from just racial battle fatigue but to bring in the intersectionality piece as well and so i'm able to um you know add a lot to the scholarship that may not be there right now so um i can't say that it was a challenge but it was sort of fascinating for me to uh you know meet some of the pioneers uh, in, uh, in the work that I'm doing and, um, you know, to see a real gap and where I could, could make a difference. And it also helps me to, um, be cognizant of, of work that comes out that, uh, claims that it started with them, uh, and they give it a slightly different label. Uh, so, you know, if this co term was coined back in 2004 and in two t 2020, you come up with a slightly different phrase and say, I created this. Sorry, um, that can't happen. Like for me, I, because I've, I, I know the man who, who, who coined the phrase and, and I've done a lot of the reading and the re research. And so, you know, that just helps me to keep on my toes and, and be uh, critical about the references and the resources that I use for my work and to make sure that uh, what it is, is is authentic and so often when I'm researching I start at the reference section I want to see who this particular author used and who they reference and then you start to see the names that come up often you start to see the works that come up often and that helps me to really guide um, what what I'm doing so challenge no, not necessarily, but definitely uh, worth the, the, the effort. That's wonderful. And I, research you're doing is just amazing. And then be able to meet those that are in the field or who are kind of on the edge and doing the, the latest research is amazing. So uh, it's just one of the benefits of being in the doc program. And, um, and so, Anthony, uh, same thing. So uh, was it a challenge or not? Or did you already know what you wanted to do? Or was it kind of exploratory? <laughs> You know, it changed a great deal. Um, I, I came into the program with an idea of what I wanted to do. And luckily, I, the program at, UN, at UNO really emphasizes intellectual identity and, and finding who you are in terms of uh, your scholarship, the type of inquiry, the types of questions that you're drawn to. And so we had amazing faculty that really supported um, diversity of thought. Um, I think in terms of the process overall, the two things that really kind of propelled me for were iteration and critique. Um, you're gonna write things over and over and over again. And I look back and to this very day, I'll just randomly send uh, my dissertation chair, Ethel Williams, a text just thanking her for reading the garbage, uh, you know, first, second, third, fourth iterations, um, and really providing me with uh, very insightful and thoughtful uh, critique. And I think, as I mentioned critique, one of the things that's important is part of the process is developing a thick skin. We tend to have these ideas and we want to hold them to ourselves, but it's not until you release them and allow other people to um, to see them for themselves and, and add perspective to it. Joanna talked about that just a few minutes ago about looking at it from the top, the bottom, the side. We think we can do all of that on our own, but we really can't. It requires having other eyes, having other perspectives. Um, to really help broaden and, and fine tune at the same time um, our research. 
I just wanted to have a few other comments about this because I think this is really important. Uh, there are two schools of thought, or at least I like to say there are two schools of thought about the dissertation process. Uh, some think of it as the piece de resistance, right? Like this is the thing that's going to introduce you to the world. It's the most important project that you're ever going to do. Um, I hate to burst many bubbles, but likely the only people that are going to read it in its entirety are your committee members, the people that have to write. And so I went into a dissertation thinking that like I had to write like I mean Ibram Kendi's book was was huge at the time. I was like, I gotta write a I gotta write something that puts my name in the history books. And my chair Ethel Williams really helped me to reframe that thinking and thinking of a dissertation as evidence of scholarly of scholarly potential, right? It's it showcases that you are able to direct your own research, to ask questions and to answer those questions. And along with that, she also helped me to think about, you asked earlier about like, did I know what I was going into and, and many of those different things. There were aspects of my early research questions that were so big and so grand, and I'm not going to give you all, I'm not going to say what Ethel told me. Uh, I don't think I can say that in this setting. But essentially what she was saying is like, you have to think research agenda and research question. Projects are built on questions. Careers are built on agendas. And so sometimes there are questions that you may have with these big, broad ideas that you're thinking about, and you have to learn to break them down and build them over time. And so with my research agenda, um, I knew and I still am kind of working towards the first idea that I had and what she helped me to recognize and realize is that you have to build your own building blocks to get to that point to be able to, to research the, the broader comparative public administration questions that I had before I could compare, you know, the Nordic model of social policy to the US model of social policy, I first had to have a very strong understanding of the US model and that and the the context in which I hope to study it, and no one had done it at that point. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say earlier, I mentioned, you know, reading broadly, the my dissertation topic actually came from, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, two sentences from a 2002 essay or article written by Vicki Lenz, who was a social work scholar. Um, she essentially conducted uh, an ACF framework analysis, so an advocacy coalition framework analysis of um, various policy actors leading up to the 1996 welfare reform and the news media. So what were they saying and how was it being presented in the news media? And there were two lines where she mentioned bureaucrats, non-elected, non-appointed officials. And she mentioned that they identified structural problems or structural antecedents of the problem, but their proposed policy solutions did not address those same antecedents. Instead, they focused on individual action. And for me, that was a non sequitur. And I was so caught up in that, how can, how is that possible? Possible that you can even frame an argument to where you say that these things lead to poverty, but when we propose a solution, we don't address these things at all. And that's actually what, le I mean, that's what my entire dissertation is built on, is that premise of trying to get a better understanding of how that happened. I'm just now inspired to kind of jump into action with you now. <laughs> Philip, hey, um, same question. Uh, you did a little bit already get into your topic, but uh, if you want to elaborate more into uh, yeah, 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 I think I already kind of uh, spoke to the uh, academic part, but I guess one thing that I want to mention is, uh, and of course, is uh, it's it's pre in my case there 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 was also this personal component about the topic that I ended up selecting because at the end of the day the race and ethnicity are contextually bounded social constructions. And before living here in the US, the way that I understood or know <laughs> uh, race and ethnicity was, was really different. And that, that, that's all to say that living in Nebraska was or is still a, a, an interesting experience in that, in that regard. And, and I guess that also informed my, my, my preference for understanding better these ideas of race and ethnicity coming from other uh, disciplines, mainly sociology. Uh, so, and, and I guess this is part of uh, probably a, a, a larger question, like how much do you allow your personal, personal experience to, 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 to inform your academic life? Because for some people, that's, that's not ideal under uh uh you know like this idea of, of, of objectivity and, and and i'm saying this because at the very uh, some of the uh, earliest stages of, of my uh 
uh, dissertation proposal, I came across this term, this term research instead of research. I, and I remember that uh, uh, Dr. Susan Good and I had a conversation with her about this and, and she did a great job encouraging me to explore the, these ideas about race and ethnicity in contexts like, 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 like Mexico. So just to try to answer the question again, of course, the academic part is, is, is fundamental, but, but, but there's also a, a personal experience that we, in my opinion, we should allow to, 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 to offer some guidance to beyond the pure uh, academic uh, endeavor of a, of, a, of a PhD program and a PhD dissertation. One of the things I'm hearing from everyone is how personal the journey is when you're going to the doc program. And you know, we all grow as individuals in this process. So it's, um, it's an exciting process, hard, but exciting. Um, so for the next question, I'm gonna jump a little bit here. Um, so did you know what career you wanted to pursue after, well, I know some are in the midst of completing your, your program, uh, and I know some are currently working, um, but when you were in the program, or as you are now, are you looking at what careers you might be considering, maybe a career change uh, to stay where you are uh, and so forth? Um, I'll, I'll jump with Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting question. I don't know exactly what I want, but with my MPA and with the PhD, the world is open to me, right? I can get a job in any sector, any industry, anywhere across this country for the most part, right? Uh, I know that a lot of times with the PhD programs, they want us to go into academia. At this point in my life, I'm unwilling to play the tenure track game. I'll be at least 60 by the time that happens, not playing that game. It's not worth it to me at this point to do that. Um, not to say that I don't want to teach. I actually love being in the classroom, but that is just not like the end all and be all for me. And I actually think I do make a better impact or a greater impact as a practitioner, right? I, I, I'm a writer. I'm a policy person. Um, I, I think that I can have a greater impact, particularly because I can do it from from any sector. So there are no limits for me. Um, I know I don't want to be a politician, <laughs> you know, um, but it, it's just, it's, it's open for me at this point. And I'm very clear that what I am supposed to do is on the other side of that degree. Everything up until this point has been preparation for what that's going to be. And so I'm, I'm open to what that might be. Um, I've, I think I've made my process a little easier because I knew what I wanted in terms of my dissertation coming in and all of my classes, all of my work has been towards that. Um, and, and it will come, it will, it will culminate. So um, at this point, I'm just, I'm, I'm open. Now, as I listened to your mind, one of my teachers mentioned that the dissertation paper is not the end, but the beginning. And so you, you mentioned work towards something on the other side. So it, it just reminded me of that discussion I had. And um, uh, Joanna, uh, I know that, uh, you know, I've talked about careers a lot. So uh, how was it going for you with that one? <laughs> mm, okay. Well, um for me i had to put things or think about things um in terms of okay what is it that i want to achieve personally professionally and what um am i going to be happy with because i know personally i mean a lot a lot of us who are first gen we we go into school and we go into higher education mainly to to climb the social ladder right like to, um, to just have it a little bit better than the way it was handed to us. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I entered academia, of course, for the same reasons, just like everyone else I think did. And then you, you end up staying because you, you love the education, you love, you love um, the subjects that you're, that you're pouring yourself into. And uh, I guess I, because I knew, like, well, at least I was working at a, 
at a university that had a focus on science, on STEM research, and everything was going to STEM and STEM, STEM. And so, um, and the reason, and the reason for that was quite clear, right? Like a lot of the funding is in STEM. A lot of um, a lot of funding from schools is taking out of the humanities in order to put it in STEM. Um, at the time, the university that I was working for um, just wanted me to, you know, of course you want, like I was, I'm always, I've always been in an international setting. So I've always worked with students who are English uh, learners or English um, second or third language um, speakers. And so I, my job was to prepare them for academic English as much as possible within a very short span. And, and it almost felt as if, um, they wanted to bypass so many things just in order to to um, to get ahead, and of course that's that's okay to a degree. But at the same time, um, like there was just no no place for humanities, and so it was it was a bit bleak when I was applying to programs because it was like, well, I'm not going into STEM. Like that's not where my heart is. That's not where my skill set is. And um, do you do I really need to take out like? $150,000 loan to then work for a place that's not going to pay me that in the first 10 years. And, you know, that, that's a reality for a lot of people. And it was for me too. And I'm not ashamed to say that I, I come from, um, from non-academic background. I, my, my mom, my mom sells tacos and burritos from a restaurant and, and that's dignified work and that's proud work. And so, um, my parents have always let me know that um, as long it doesn't matter what you do, as, as long as you you do your best and, and you provide for yourself and your family, we're, we'll be proud of you. And having that and having that knowledge and and not going into academia for for um, for I guess what, what, how do I state it like for advancing in I guess social class right because I know a lot of people also think about that. Um, I am open to a lot of perspectives. I know that this will open the doors for me. I hope that I continue lecturing at um, at a university. I hope I hope to find tenure somewhere. Um, I know that it's quite scary sometimes because, especially in the humanities, especially um, in the things that I love, especially in education in our country. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh my goodness, like, why do we defund from it so much? It's so important, especially now more than ever, when you have uh, babies shooting babies, you know, because eight, for me, 18 years old, that's a baby still, and no one really talks about that, um, and, and it does come down to education, and so um, going into this field with this prospect of, like, you know, I might not find that great paying job that I'm hoping to find. I, I know that I'm very aware of that, but um, but I'll be happy as long as I know that I'm continue I'm 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 doing projects and I'm doing research for for things that are quite meaningful to me and that where I know that it's quite, that it's needed because I know that right now as I'm doing research I'm so thankful for the people who who wrote about who who dared write about the topics that no one else was writing at that time and so I know that hopefully in the future some of the work that I'm going to do someone will read it and like, oh my goodness, thank God that this person wrote about this because now I can, I can go forward or, or, or use that. Um, so, I mean, I hope to lecture. I hope to always be um, in the classroom somehow because I can't do this desk work to be honest. Like I thought like maybe I could be um, some kind of organizer manager, but I don't think, I, I think, I think I know where my place is pretty much. And, um, and yeah. I look forward to hearing more of the lectures that you will be given in the future. And I have to, I have to say, being a uh, classmate, it's been an honor to be in a class with you. Uh, I actually got to go to a different question uh, before we get into the Q&A with the audience. Um, Philippe, so uh, what do you believe are some of the social equity issues facing the United States and or your local area? And if you want to tie it maybe with uh, Mexico as well. well the, the, unfortunately, the, the, the answer is straightforward in my opinion, and it's racial inequalities, institutional racism, broadly speaking. Like in, in my mind, there's no doubt about that. 
And if you want to break down that by policy arenas, it's clear healthcare, like the pandemic has shown it again, as Dr. Gooden talked about this double pandemic, healthcare policing, policing. It's, I mean, that's sadly, again, I think that's the, the, the reality of, of, of this country. And I'm glad that you mentioned Mexico too, because in Mexico, we're having a really, until recently acknowledging how the way someone looks can make a difference. How, uh, again, you know, like intersections with gender, how, how are those intersections important? So I guess that's all to say that the, 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 in terms of social equity, again, racial inequalities are the probably, or, or, or most likely the, the, the most pressing issue in, in this country and in, in many other countries around the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Anthony, same question. Uh, what do you believe are some of the social equity issues facing the United States and or your local area? If I had to sum it all up in one word, I'd say ignorance. Uh, and what I mean by that is we, there's a, in my opinion, there's a need for more critical perspectives and public administration in particular. Public administration theory for me as a area of concentration was an interesting, it was, it was very nebulous. Um, when studying it as a doctoral student, but moving into the profession and into the professorship, it's always astounding to me when I have students at the end of the semester that do their course evaluations and they'll say, you know, I've been in this program, you know, also, you know, I'm, this is my last semester in the program, right? And this is the first time we've actually talked about many of these issues that are, in my opinion, some of the most profound issues um, in terms of the work of public governance, right? If we talk about reducing inequality, how can you talk about that if folks don't understand privilege, if they don't understand um, power and how it operates and how it's being defined? And along the, that line, I mean, my research is moving into the space of disparities in civic literacy, the ways in which individuals, laymen and, and folks who are not in um, our classrooms, right, how they understand civic processes and how to become engaged uh, and things of that nature. And so I think combating ignorance on all fronts is, is probably one of the most pressing issues that we have in terms of social equity and our social equity agenda moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, actually, do I want to ask one more question to our panel here? Um, and just kind of a, a quick like one minute answer to this one is what leadership styles do you believe would be valuable in addressing the social equity issues that each of you have just mentioned um and uh, uh start with uh Philippe and yeah. so yeah thank you please so uh, i guess more than a specific style i guess uh there are some features that I admire in, in, in some leaders in the field. Uh, and again, uh, some, some like Dr. Good and Dr. Blessed, Dr. Richard Gregory Johnson. So being brave, being committed, and, and, and none of them are excellent researchers. So I guess, I, I guess that would be my, my answer. That's uh, what I think would be uh, that it's needed to address social equity. Uh, in, in, in academia and, and, and of course, in, in the real world, ideally. That's a good point, actually, having heroes too, right? Mentors, those that we can look up to as well. And that's a really good point. Um, so I'll kind of throw that in as well with the question. Uh, Anthony, you want to go next? I would say transformational leadership and visionary leadership, uh, transformational leadership, being able to challenge folks in terms of thinking in new ways and visionary leadership in terms of helping folks see a way forward. I don't actually consider myself a radical, but whenever I find myself in spaces with other folks, apparently I am a radical. I don't, I've never understood why we hold so, so tightly to systems and processes and ideas that, that haven't served us well over the years. And so I think part of that is folks can't see beyond that. And so I think it requires visionary leadership to help them see the world that we're trying to build. Uh, Wendy? Um, I think the one leadership style that will not work is Leslie Fair. That's how we got to where we are now, doing nothing. Uh, so that's definitely off the table. Um, I do think that like most other things, certain situations demand certain leadership styles. When you're in crisis, 
um, you've got to be that my way or the highway. You don't have time to ask people for their, you know, whatever their ideas are. You have to make some decisions and move forward. Um, but when you're, you know, at equilibrium, you know, I, I, I agree with you, Anthony. You need someone who's forward thinking, right? Who's not going to wait to just something happens and then address it. Let's think about what this means and how do we change it before there's a, there, there's a particular issue, right? You need someone who's risk tolerant because not everybody's gonna be on board and not everything is going to work, but even the failures are a part of, uh, of, of the journey if you learn from it, if you use it to continue to, to drive forward what you need to do. But yes, visionary, I agree, because you need to know where you're going and that might be a part where you're a little bit more democratic. How do we get there? There might be some other perspectives, but uh, we definitely need folks who are willing to be boots on the ground all the time. It's not enough about just making statements, right? Statements don't do anything. They don't cook the rice. They don't pay the bills. What are we doing? We've got to be, you know, action oriented. Just listen, I'm just feel like I'm getting more energized just listening to all this. It's amazing. Joanna, any, any thoughts on leadership styles or, or the vision or uh, role models? I was reading um, Bill Hooks' Transgressing, I think it's Classrooms Education. I'm not going to pretend to know because I kind of forgot the title. But there was a really big point in one of her chapters where she's talking about liberatory education or education for for liberation purposes, for finding yourself and for finding your reflection reflected back to you in society. And one of, but one of the important parts that I took away from her was it's not enough to talk about it, it's be about it. So yes, our leadership programs, it's good that they emphasize all these qualities to, to promote social equity, but what are they also doing to, to promote social equity from their perspective? Like, are they shutting down doors? Are they still following like the policies that have always been in place or or are they being about it as well? That's what I kind of want to see. Very cool, very cool. So I am now, oh, uh, did you want to say something, Anthony? I'll chime in. There was a question earlier, like at the very beginning, and I just wanted to say there was a question about first generation student experiences. Uh, two quotes very quickly. Issa Rae said that you should you should network horizontally. A lot of times we wanna network vertically, right? Like we have these people that we fangirl over, Pat Shields, uh, Mary Guy was one of the folks that I was in love with, right? And it's important that you work with your peers, right? These are the people who are gonna be going through the ranks with you. And that's what my support system is made up of. And in terms of the first generation student experience, Van Jones has this amazing interview where he talks about his experiences in law school. And at this point, as a doctoral student, we're all professional students. We know how to make, like how to get the grade, right? Like we know what to do in the classroom. And what he found out after he graduated was that it's so much more than just what takes place in the classroom, uh, that many of his peers were doing doing clerkships and, and having dinners with faculty members and those types of things. And so thinking about different ways that you can get involved with faculty members, everyone wants a piece of their time and the best way to, um, I wouldn't say curry favor, right? But to be able to get FaceTime with an individual is to be a support to them as opposed to always wanting more of their time, right? So finding ways that you can help them with research and things that can fit into your schedule but aren't too burdensome. Which that's a, a great topic. We can go into that if, uh, if Philip Hay or Wendy or Joanna, if you'd like to uh, elaborate more into that question. I'm, I'm looking for it right now, but it's about first generation. Uh, well, I can't speak from a first gen perspective because I'm not a first gen um, scholar. Uh, so I, I come from a family where education is um, extremely important. And um, although I will be the first PhD in the family, there are some MDs and JDs. So, you know, I can't speak from, from that perspective. Uh, Anthony, one thing I think I might disagree with you just a little bit is the, the, the horizontal. I, I would say that it needs to be that 360 because you need the foundation to build on. Uh, you need the folks to move with you, but you also need the people that you're a fan of. I think that it, it sort of, um, all of that helps to move you along as, as the particular scholar. And so being able to network with that, having some history and foundation, but also knowing uh, folks that you aspire to be 
like or aspire to you know do the type of work they do but also those folks that are that are near you you know I remember someone saying hey if you're the smartest one in your in your group you need a new group all right um, so you're always looking to do more and to do better sometimes that's not always ahead of you that actually might be behind you as well the uh, person to be posted the question so I'll actually read it um, so as first generation students, what are some difficulties you have faced while navigating through the academic space and or navigating an advisee advisor relationship? Um, uh, Joanna Philippi. I'm not the first uh, generation student either. Uh, I guess yeah, my experience may be a little bit comparable, maybe just because I'm an immigrant. So for me, it was challenging in that regard, and probably some of the experiences that a first uh, generation student faces are similar to the ones that I face. But but again, I don't I don't know. I had I I, I I have had a different experience, and I'm happy to talk about my experience as an immigrant if if if, if that's of interest. I'm a first gen. <laughs> um... I've been for I'm first gen, but I've also had the immigrant experience from uh, living abroad and from and first gen immigrant parents. So uh, I would like to say that it's quite lonely. It's a quite lonely um, experience as doctoral program um, because uh, you might find your cohort who understands like the victories and the, the small victories and the small failures that accompany you throughout the process, but you don't really find that outside of your small cohort that's doing your PhD with you. Um, my family has always valued education. Um, they just never had the opportunity to, to pursue it in the way that they would have loved to. And so they sacrifice, right, for the well-being of their family. And so here I am doing it for them and for myself as well and for a, a whole community. And that's how I see it. Um, I, one of the things I guess really specifically that I can think of at the moment is that I think once you, once you reach into academia, yes, like, like, like Anthony said, like the horizontal networking, I think first gen students are quite good at that because um, that's a lot, sometimes it's quite um, scary to, for lack of a better word at the moment um, to approach someone to say, hey, I'm sorry, but I don't know how to do this. Could you tell me? And it's much easier to to approach someone on your level, like, hey, how did you get that paper published? Or, hey, what did you think of that professor? Oh, hey, your program, how much did it cost? Where'd you get the funding? Things like that. And so I think we're really good at that. Um, but one of the things that um, I think in academia they take for granted is um, some of the small basic things that people assume that you know how to do, but you're actually learning as a first gen. So for example, I would have, I would love to see at my campus in the University of San Francisco more workshops on how to turn your essays into publishable, publishable papers in, in, in journals, because that's something I'm still navigating and, and trying to do. And, and I know that there are some who already have that experience, either um, from being there for so long or maybe their parents know and so they've they've seen that but because I haven't that's just something that's not there um, so some, so something really specific like that that people take for granted that aren't isn't really seen it's kind of like privilege like right when you have privilege you don't really see like well what's missing what's not missing and so what I can say is that like more workshops on how to turn your essays into publishable pieces how to um, how to prepare how to navigate like the scholarship process or how to find um, funding, how to find, uh, how to find funding for your dissertation outside of your institute. Um, network, network, networking through those, those paths as well. That's something I feel that is missing. Please, can I just add, you know, part of that question had to do with navigating the uh, advisor advisee um, partnership or process. Um, I think it's really helpful, particularly when you're first coming in, speak to students who are already in the program. Ask them about their experiences with faculty. What do they think about them? What do they think about their personality? So you can begin to um, make some decisions about who you think might be uh, helpful or beneficial to you, but also interview them, speak with them, because you've got to make sure they're a good fit for you and they need to figure out if you're a good fit for them my chair, I asked my chair uh, 
I went in knowing I wanted this person to be my chair. So I was past the advisor stage. I want this person to be my chair, but she had to be my advisor. I literally walked in her office and sat down. She said, why are you here? Because I want to talk about you being my advisor and my chair. She says, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm not going to baby you. I will help you in any way I can. But if you can't deal with that, get up and walk out of my office right now, literally. Um, and I appreciated that because I don't want someone who's going to yes me through the process. And when I get to the end, well, you need to do this or you should have done that. Tell me what I need from the beginning. Be honest. And yes, Anthony, that means I had to develop a thick skin. <laughs> um, but I appreciated that. So, you know, that's a, a, a way that I could have made a decision saying, yeah, maybe this person is a little bit too intense for me and let me go some somewhere else. And so uh, we have to sort of get past some of those areas of fear um, and, and look at what's going to be most beneficial to us in this process. Brilliant point, actually, that, you know, good communication with uh, teachers, with the advisor, with the committee. And, you know, if you have one that doesn't communicate often or doesn't give you all the information from the start, it can make the process really daunting uh, and just frustrating and feel like you have to go two steps forward, one step back. Uh, I want to mention uh, uh, Philippe uh, stating the hidden curriculum. I like that phrase for the thing that needs to really be teaching students, right? Uh, making a comment onto Joanna's uh, statement. Um, and then Joanna uh, made a comment about, you know, finding advisor to aspire, push and support. So another question that I'm seeing here is, how do you suggest finding a mentor, especially for someone who doesn't have a network of peers that are knowledgeable about this journey? And I'll kind of leave it open for, for anyone to jump in. I have a thought on that one. <laughs> so uh, this it, it, it's just a suggestion. Maybe I, I, I don't know if this is the most uh, helpful one, but again, just out of my experience, uh, some um, associations provide uh, networking opportunities and mentorship opportunities uh, specifically. Tessa, if you're in the field of public administration, um, ASPA has a mentorship opportunity through the Founders uh, Program. And I'm happy to uh, share my application materials or talk about the, the, the process if, if that's if that's helpful. But that's all to say that as part of that program, uh, I, my, my, main, my, my mentor, and this was last year, was uh, Dr. Richard Gregory Johnson. So my experience has been amazing. He has been super helpful and that's the main reason why I'm here tonight, because he uh, invited me to be part of the of the conference, and and and, and as he mentioned earlier, he uh, uh, suggested this space in the first place. So yeah, that that's one of the routes. Uh, if if you want to explore that, it's uh, the Founders Fellows Program at the American Society for Public Administration. Um, I would say you know what you really you have to talk to people and listen to people. Um, I have two main mentors who are sort of my comprehensive mentors who are not in public administration at all, uh, but they have both navigated the PhD process and so they understand what I'm going through. Um, and we're able to talk about just a lot of different things for me, but I find that um, I have different mentors for different things. And sometimes it might be just for a short period of time or for a specific area. Um, Marilyn Rubin, Dr. Marilyn Rubin, who you know is well known in public administration, uh, administration spaces, was a professor of mine when I was in my MPA program. Um, and she saw something in me, helped me through a lot of different things, helped, up to, helped to open up some opportunities for me, but um, more specifically related to um, governmental budgeting, because that's one of our areas of expertise. And then we were able to put those together with social equity. But then I have, you know, my first director when I got to the college I'm working at, um, became a mentor just in terms of being at the job and having somebody I can talk to uh, when things are not going right. So it's not that you have to have one mentor 
for everything, but uh, talk to people and listen to them because sometimes it might just be, you know, someone who can be an ear for you or someone who sees things in you that you don't see in yourself, who can sort of push you or at least, um, you know, put some thoughts in your head, whether you act on them or not. Um, they, they, they provide some seeds for you. So it's a matter of really doing just what you're asking for, networking, talk to people, meet people, and, and, and understand they're not always going to be people who are older than you. They're not always going to be people who are uh, more veteran than you in the process or work. A, a mentor could be one of your fellow students who just thinks differently or, or just has a way of supporting you. So just be open to meeting people and talking to people, letting them know what you're doing, what you need, and see how you can connect to get those needs met. I think Wendy said it all, and she said it all so beautifully. Where I'm from in the country, uh, uh, in Virginia, they would say the doors of the church are now open. But uh, with that being said, the only thing that I would add to that is it's about strategy too, right? Mentoring is, um, it's, 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 it's not, you know, laissez-faire coffee, right? Like you go, when, when you're meeting with your mentor, there's an agenda, whether formal, like you write it up and print it out sometimes like I would, or it's informal, right? But you want to make sure that you're using that time wisely. And I would say, Wendy talked about it earlier, right? Like find folks that you want to, 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 that you aspire to be like, right? So for teaching, uh, Omowali Akintunde was a black studies professor of mine that was one of the most masterful instructors that I've ever seen in my entire life. And so I worked very closely with him as a TA, learning how he designed classes and, and designed his, his syllabi and those types of things. Uh, Jody Benenson, who's on this call, uh, I remember when I was uh, in the, the latter stages of my uh, doctoral program, she was an early career scholar and everyone wanted her to be their mentor, but she was for us uh, the embodiment of what an early career scholar looks like, right? Like what does it mean when you're actually, you know, put into a tenure track position and having to make something out of it? Um, and so thinking about where you want to develop various skill sets and then find folks who, um, Again, you want to emulate, but also as Wendy mentioned, right? Like it's it's got to be a good fit. Um, someone could be an amazing researcher, right? And I don't know if I can say this in a professional setting, but they could also be an asshole, right? And so you want to find people who are who are good to you that you can also be good to, right? Like that you all can have a good working relationship. And I think the way that Wendy framed it earlier, right? Like it's a partnership. And so think partnership. Yeah, I totally second that um, to mirror a little bit of what Wendy and Anthony have stated already. Um, at least in my experience, um, I would like to say that my, the mentors I have now gave me like the confidence and the, the self-love to kind of see it as almost, almost an interview process, you know? It's almost an interview process because don't think that, um, you have to bless them or you have to do this for them. Like, don't think of this as high horse, low horse, you know, find, find a reciprocal relationship where you will benefit, but also that person will benefit. It's a mutual benefit, benefiting relationship. Um, because what's the point of having a mentor who is brilliant, but make you feel small or they make you feel, or, or they're just unavailable to you. What's, what's the point of that? You know, you could admire the work from reading some of the published work that they have. That's, I think that's enough, but, um, definitely someone who's going to give you that um, that time. Like they said, you have to find a match. Um, and yeah, see yourself, see your work as important enough and worthy enough to to see it as almost an interview process. Like who's who's a good match for you mm -hmm. as well? Not just, you know, don't, don't just follow like the clout is what I would like to say. Cause I, I know that I've done that before in the very early stages of this process. and. And you get, you get your heart broken in, in different ways, <laughs> you know, and Wendy talked about having thick skin and stuff, and that's all true, but the world is hard as it is, and this program is expensive, and I'm not, you know, hanging out at friends' barbecues in order to be here. Why would I want to make it even more difficult for myself? No, I want I want support. I want people to believe in my ideas, and I want to work um, for, for the things that, and I want to support equally, and I want to believe in their ideas, too, and I want this to be a building relationship, not a relationship that's going to make me feel like I'm I'm not worthy of or or smaller than or 
I'm lucky to know. And Not for me. <laughs> don't 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 just be a receptacle. Be a mm. vessel, right? Um, I, I tell my mentees that the greatest disservice I could do to my mentors is to take everything that they have given to me and keep it to myself, right? I know that they have been so good to me that I need to pass that on to somebody else, right? And likewise, if you've got someone who really doesn't make you feel good and doesn't treat you right, don't do that to somebody else, right? That just doesn't make sense. But, you know, be, be someone who can get that information but also pass it on. It doesn't have to be a, an official mentor relationship for you to pass on some advice to someone else that you've been given by your mentors, but someone else will appreciate that you thought enough of them to give them um, up out of what has been uh, fed into your life. And if I could, I would just briefly say, I call it the hard sciences relationship. So if you study like biology, chemistry, those types of things, you work in a lab and your dissertation, your research is, is usually some iteration of your mentor's research. Whatever they're working on, that's gonna be the thing that you're gonna be working on. And so I think it's important that you find, yes, it's, I mentioned earlier, like finding folks to emulate, but also as, I think has been stated in, in a number of different ways, right? You want to find people that support you to be your best self as a researcher, as a scholar, as an instructor, all of those things. And so there are aspects of them that you may want to emulate, but you also want to make sure that in that partnership and in that relationship that you're building, that you are finding your own voice and your own self and that in the work that you all are doing together. This is all wonderful. It's all wonderful. It, great advice. Actually, I'm in the midst of going through the doc program too, so I'm kind of taking some of this in as well. Uh, to um, one more question, and then uh, I do actually want to open up because there was someone who has a, another question, I think, who wants to ask directly. Uh, but anyway, so the, one question is, uh, how do you begin a conversation with your advisor if you feel as though you are being belittled or looked over? Um, and so I just want to make sure other questions or kind of give like a maybe 30 second uh, or one minute uh, reply to that question. Oh, and anyone, anyone can jump in, sorry. Um, that, that, that's a difficult prospect depending on whether you've chosen this person or whether they've been assigned to you, right? If they've been assigned to you, you may not have a whole lot of choice in dealing with that, but um, still you have to be um, as upfront as possible. Right. This is this is about you getting through a process and getting what you need, um, and you've got to talk with them and hope that you can come to some common ground on how you're going to to interact. I don't think there's any one way to do that because you know the human factor is always a part. You have no idea how they're going to respond to that. But I would say know what you want, know what you're asking for, and and put that out there. I would add to that with evidence. I think for some folks, it could be that they are just completely oblivious to their behaviors, right? As a, one of the things that I was not prepared for moving or transitioning from the doctoral student experience to the faculty experience is time. Time is your greatest resource and nobody talks about it. When you're a doctoral student, not very many people want much of your time, but when you become, like when you move into that faculty role, there's so many people and so many different committees and other things that are vying for your time. So if you're being overlooked, it could be, you know, it, it, it really could be that it's not, uh, it's not intentional. Um, but I would also say with evidence, because let's say that, you know, this is a situation that later on becomes extremely problematic to the point where you may have to talk to, uh, you know, the department chair or someone else about finding a new, whoever is assigning these individuals. If you need to speak to someone else, you want to make sure that you have that evidence. So I wouldn't say go in there as if you're going, you know, to argue a court case, but just being able to have some examples that you can bring to their attention um, as part of that conversation. Those are, that's a tough situation. Um, it invokes bad memories <laughs> in my old workplace. <laughs> um, I, I had a boss who was uh, the only one that had, had the research of, you know, the research interest that I had and she was so horrible. Like, I think I blocked her mentally. 
um at the time she was signing my paycheck still so I couldn't not talk to her I couldn't not deal with her it was the, the literally the hand that fed me and it was a miserable time I'm not gonna lie but uh I think you're going to be the only one with the resources and the knowledge and the capabilities to manage that situation um because you're the one who's there and you're the one who knows best out of everyone so um I think that a lot, some of the things that have helped is remembering that, you know, those those advisors, those professors, they're human beings too. And so you want, at least for me, what helped me was avoid conversations where you know that they're going to feel attacked and try to go through the route of empathy so that they can try to see your perspective, but without them necessarily feeling attacked. And it might take, you know, going into some of those um, de-escalating type of like workshops or or something like that that will help you um but then yeah it's it's quite tough I send you good vibes and good luck and lots of hugs <laughs> I don't want to jump in front of Philippe if he wants to add anything um no, not really. Like again, I'm really fortunate, and my, my advisor is amazing. All right. Um, so we are getting towards the end, and we do need to wrap this up. Um, so just kind of a side note uh, to say that this is the last session uh, of the conference for today, and um, sorry, I'm sort of reading a couple comments here that just popped up here. Um, yes, and then the, tomorrow uh, there will be more more conferences and sessions tomorrow if you're interested in coming in. And um, so yeah, I, I guess just to send, essentially to thank the panelists for uh, coming to join us here today. Thank you so much, Anthony, Wendy, Joanna, and Felipe. It's been wonderful. I really enjoyed hearing the comments and things. I hope the audience have enjoyed it as well. It's been wonderful. Uh, questions that have cropped up in this. And um, and actually, I would love to be able to stay in touch uh, with Anthony and Wendy. So maybe I, if I can catch you guys, I'll send you a message in the future if I can. Uh, it'd be wonderful to stay in touch. And so um, I believe uh, we are at the end of this. And Could I yeah, yeah. quickly just close with the greatest piece of advice that I was ever given, uh, or at least I would I've had a lot of great pieces of advice. Uh, a few years ago, I did the Building Future Faculty um, program at uh, North Carolina State University. And one of the associate deans spoke to our cohort and the piece of advice that she gave us was ask for more. Um, in an academic setting, every, I mean, there's never a time when a, 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 an institution is strapped for resources, right? But if you're, even if you're negotiating contracts, if you're a doctoral student, if you need support, ask for it. Uh, let the university and let them tell you what they can't do, but you don't ever, um, be your own barrier, right? So in any situation where you're in need of resources, you're in need of support, please ask for it. Uh, and I think that that will serve you well throughout your, uh, throughout your, your journey. Thank you, Anthony, for that. Thank you. So I will, uh, I'm just gonna stay here and um, we have about one more minute or this will be wrapping up. Um, so feel free to stay behind if you like, or um, we'll be signing out soon. Thanks for moderating, please. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Great job, please. That was awesome. Good to Good see you. Good to meet you all. Same.